Now? Yeah, there we go. Okay, this morning, uh, if you want to go ahead and get your Bible open, we're in Joshua chapter 23, 24, the last two chapters of Joshua. This is actually the last class of the quarter for us in here. Um, and we'll talk more about that at the end. Uh, so we let's do a wrap-up here. Um, I'm good at wrap-ups. My wife says I, I wrap things up too well. I, at the end of the evening, I like to go over the whole day and, and uh, fix anything that, that needs to be closed and, and done. And uh, so that's what we're going to see here, actually. Uh, Joshua's going to do the same thing. If you remember in Deuteronomy, Moses did exactly that. He was approaching the end of his life. He wanted to talk to his children. Okay, now I say that because Moses, this, these were the people that he loved, he led, he cared for. Uh, he spoke to them uh, from God through Moses to the people. Uh, he had been mixed in with their lives since even before they left Egypt. Any leader that's a good leader gets involved with the people. He knows their life. He, he, he cares for them in a way that um, wants to see the best for them. And, and Moses has done this in leading them towards the, now I say towards the promised land, because we know how long it took to actually get there you know with Moses uh, they had already if you see on the map there the east side you're right they had already conquered that portion with Moses and given it to those tribes okay half tribe of Manasseh Gad and Reuben they had defeated their enemies throughout that territory under Moses In Deuteronomy Moses is close to death he knows this it is time for him to, to pass. And so he takes the opportunity to talk to his very large family. And he's wrapping up everything that they have done. He's wrapping up God's uh, law and commands and words to them, reminding them just as any father would do. You know, even whenever we send our kids out of the house, we, we always want to take that opportunity to, to spend some time with them and say, okay. I want you to remember some things. Okay, I've taught you these things throughout your life, but I especially want you to remember them and carry forward. Moses did that. We see the same thing with Joshua. Joshua has led these people across the Jordan into the promise, the rest of the promised land. Okay, so consider all of it the promised land, but now they've crossed into the west side the rest of the promised land they're conquering the cities there they they had one one big hiccup because of somebody's sin and Joshua has has helped them through everything they've been he's leading them from the front from the middle from the side he is involved with them he understands them he has been with them since they left Egypt okay we're not talking about a leader that just got in there and, and uh, doesn't, you know, today's businesses. How many times do they hire a, 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 a president or a CEO from another company and it's something completely different, but they hire him for his administrative experience or his, his accounting experience or his success, but he doesn't really know the company. He has to go in there and learn about it learn about the people that's not the case with Joshua Joshua has been in the in the middle in the thick of everything from the very beginning from the time they were in Egypt when they left all the battles that they have fought since that time Joshua has been a warrior he has defeated other kings other cities other armies he has protected the people he's lived among them he knows them after Moses passes and that mantle of leadership goes to Joshua okay now it's a huge responsibility but Joshua takes it up we don't see any any hesitation there he just gets started right in and moves on he's like okay here we go let's roll up our sleeves we're about to get dirty 
in all of this, we see that Joshua has given the glory to God. Joshua has not wanted the glory for himself, the credit for himself. Okay? And so at everything he's done, he's pointing back to God. Let's keep that in mind as we move through here. Let's go ahead and uh, uh, get started in the chapter, read through. I uh, hope you've read through it too. And uh, we'll stop along through here and, and talk about different uh, aspects. So chapter 23, verse 1. After a long time had passed, and the Lord had given Israel rest from all their enemies around them, Joshua, by then a very old man, summoned all Israel, their elders, leaders, judges, and officials. Okay, I want to stop right there. I want you to have a picture here. So when I originally... You know, as a kid growing up learning about this, when, when he summoned all of Israel, I had this picture that, wow, millions of, pic of people there before him. How in the world did he talk to all of them? How did they hear him? But as, as many of us know, as we study, we start understanding things better. Okay, and that's what it took for me to really understand that, to, to make a better picture this wasn't millions of people in front of him spread out and he was shouting at them from a mountaintop or something. This was the leaders, all the leaders of all the tribes, the people there, you know, the elders, the leaders, the judges and officials. Now that's kind of an order there. The elders are gonna be up there, the older experienced people that are leading because of their age and experience and their wisdom. The leaders, those who are maybe not quite as old, are still leading uh, from the front, leading their tribes, leading their clans, leading their families. The judges, exactly what that word means. The, those who are, are, are dealing with the law, making decisions about what's right and what's not. You know, just as we have judges today, they had judges at that time too, and, and they were a huge part of God's plan for the nation of Israel keeping them on the right track. Um, and then there was the officials, kind of the administrative people, all right? The government workers, think of it like that. They're the ones that dotting the I's, crossing the T's, and making sure everything was, a, they were also the, the record keepers. They could keep the history of the nation itself, all right? So these are the people, now the, 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 the nation themselves, the entire nation trusts these people. They have put in in positions of authority and power and so they're, they're trustworthy positions. Joshua has called all of them, all the representatives of the people and that's who he's talking to here. Now we keep that in mind as we, as we go on because when it says the nation of Israel answers back in many ways, we got to realize it's these, these leaders that are answering for the entire nation. This is not millions of people out there going, yes, we will follow God. It's actually the leaders of the people, a much smaller group. Okay, and so we continue on. Joshua's talking to them, and he says, said to them, I am very old. You yourselves have seen everything the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake. Okay, he's reminding them, this wasn't for anything but for you. God did this for you you it was the Lord your God who fought for you remember how I have allotted as an inheritance for your tribes all the land of the nations that remain the nations I conquered between the Jordan and the Mediterranean Sea in the west okay the west side of the Jordan that's what Joshua has conquered okay the Lord your God himself will push them out for your sake. He will drive them out before you and you will take possession of their land as the Lord your God promised you. Okay, if you remember, we had said previously that not everything was conquered all at once. There were still cities, small communities, areas that needed to be, that the armies would still have to roll into and conquer, take the land. All right? Now, verse 6. Be very strong. 
Be careful to obey all that is written in the book of the law of Moses without turning aside to the right or to the left. Do not associate with these nations that remain among you. Okay? Right there he's acknowledging that there are people still there among them. Their enemies are still in there. Don't let them sway you. We've seen that over and over. We've talked about this. The, the influence other people have on us. Okay, he's warning them about this. Do not invoke the names of their gods or swear by them. You must not serve them or bow down to them. But you are to hold fast to the Lord your God as you have until now. Okay? So Joshua is wrapping all this up and saying, Okay, let's go over. I'm going to remind you of all these things. It's a, it's a warning, actually, and he, he gets even deeper into it. The Lord has driven out before you great and powerful nations. To this day, no one has been able to withstand you. One of you routs a thousand, because the Lord your God fights for you, just as he promised. So be careful to love the Lord your God. What he's telling them in all this is obedience. Obey God. Trust him. Have faith in him. Look to him. He is the only reason why you've gotten this far. It's not because of you, it's because of him. Even that, that verse there, one of you routes a thousand. Okay, now that's an, that's an, over, that's an exaggeration. Let's just realize that. It's an exaggeration. All right? But what he's saying is that with God's power, you have been able to overcome great, mighty, powerful nations, larger than yourself. Okay, if you remember uh, back a couple chapters when the army went in and all the kings uh, in the land there got together to attack, and they were hordes coming over the hills. You know, that'd be a scary sight. I just I think that the that word horde or that description was used on purpose to give us this idea that that number wise it was not even that the children of Israel were probably far outnumbered but it didn't matter because they had God's power he was going to allow them to defeat the enemy no matter how large or how outnumbered they were God's power was there Joshua was reminding them of that and then, in verse 12, he kind of takes a different tact. But, okay, we always know, but, okay, now something's coming up. But, if you turn away and ally yourselves with the survivors of these nations that remain among you, and if you intermarry with them and associate with them, then you may be sure that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations before you. Instead, they will become snares and traps for you, whips on your back, thorns in your eyes, until you perish from this good land which the Lord your God has given you. What a heavy warning for them. Okay? So he's saying, okay, this has been great. Because of God, you have taken this land, but if you don't continue to obey God, follow his laws then this is going to happen to you we know <laughs> if you've read through the Old Testament you know that that's a very short lived belief okay now it's easy for us to, to go wow how could they not know you know they've, they've been there they've seen the power of God wow but hindsight or or the next day quarterback, you know, saying, oh, that guy should have done that play. Well, that's what we're doing there because this applies to us. This is human nature. How soon do we even uh, give ourselves to God and we're dedicated and we're on fire, but, you know, temptation comes up, troubles come up, struggles and it just really kind of distracts us. And then the next thing you know, you're off on a different path. Until you wake up, hopefully, and get back there. We're exactly the same as the, the Israelite nation. Okay? We may not have those, those signs and miracles and, and, 
displays of God's power, but we have his word that we can believe and trust and know what he can do and the promise he has for us. That's our goal, is that promise. Just as they had the promised land, we have our own promised land in heaven. Okay. Back to Joshua, and uh, we're at verse 14. Now, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. Okay? The eventuality, we're all going to die. Life ends. Okay, Joshua knows this. He knows what's going to happen. It's just his way of saying, we all, we're all on the same boat here. We're heading in the same direction. Death, physical death. You know with all your heart and soul that not one of all the good promises the Lord your God gave you has failed. Every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. That is, is a statement that we live with every day. We deal with even in our own lives. Have you ever had, I'm sure you have, the experience of somebody failing you, whether a good friend, a spouse, a brother, sister, co-worker? And how does that make you feel? You know, that can really just stab you to the heart. You know, I, th- I think we've all experienced that to some degree. And Joshua is saying, your God has not failed you. Not. He has kept every promise he made to you. Okay? A reminder again. But just as all the good things the Lord your God has promised you have come to you, so he will bring on you all the evil things he has threatened until the Lord your God has destroyed you from this good land he has given you. Wow. It's kind of, kind of, it's the good and the bad, okay? Here's the good, and if you don't continue down this path, then here's the bad that's going to happen to you. And not just a, a small punishment, but to the point of destruction, okay? Now, we've seen examples of that as, as they've gone through, even to their enemies, destroy them all wipe them out so they're very familiar with that use of that term destroy them okay so they in hearing this again to themselves and applying it you would think that they would or hope that they would take it to their heart because these leaders are now going to go out and take it to their people and remind them that if you do not continue to obey God you are going to be destroyed If you violate the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and go and serve other gods and bow down to them, the Lord's anger will burn against you, and you will quickly perish from the good land he has given you. What we see again and again and again, that the number one thing that God is telling them is, you will worship only me. Only me chapter 24 of the last chapter we're about to go into that's going to be emphasized again and we're going to learn a few things about the people as he's talking to them all right chapter 24 verse 1 then okay now keep in mind this is is actually like two separate assemblies okay two different times now some some people say, well, no, this was just two accounts of the same assembly. I, in my mind, I don't think so as I study this. I think it is two different times. He has just gotten through talking to the, to the leaders, the elders, those that are going to be leading the people. Now, again, he assembles uh, the same elders, leaders, judges, and officials, and he's telling them something else. And actually, he's reinforcing what he's already told them. Then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. He summoned the elders, leaders, judges, and officials of Israel. They presented themselves before God. Okay. Presented themselves before God. God is there. 
this is, you cannot get more official, more holy than God is there. All right? Joshua said to all the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. All right, now he's speaking for God. God's there. Joshua's speaking for him. Long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River and worshipped other gods. <gasps> they did? Well, many times we forget about that. We just think of Abraham as the most steadfast servant of the Lord that trusted God 100%. But we actually forgot what went on before that. Okay, but Joshua is reminding the people. But I took your father Abraham from the land beyond the Euphrates and led him throughout Canaan and gave him many descendants. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. I assigned the hill country of Seir to Esau, but Jacob and his family went down to Egypt. Now, notice when he brings them to Egypt. They're very well aware of Egypt. That is where their immediate ancestors, the generations before them, came out of. That was the start of their, this long journey. So now he's taking them back to a, a, a more recent history that they're aware of. Okay, they know the past stuff. They, they keep track of all the generational things. But now it's more, it's hitting home more because Egypt played such a huge role in their lives. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I afflicted the Egyptians by what I did there, and I brought you out. When I brought your people out of Egypt, you came to the sea, and the Egyptians pursued them with chariots and horsemen as far as the Red Sea. But they cried to the Lord for help, and he put darkness between you and the Egyptians. He brought the sea over them and covered them. You saw with your own eyes what I did to the Egyptians. Okay. These people did not actually see this. Joshua saw it, but almost nobody, there's only Joshua and Caleb that were alive at that time. Okay, so probably in this setting, Caleb is not here. Now, that's a guess, okay, opinion. But Joshua, the leader, is there, and he has seen this with his own eyes. And so he's reminding these younger people even the elders and the leaders and the judges and the officials, they're younger. They have not seen this before. All right? So he's telling them their history. Then you lived in the wilderness for a long time. All right. They know that. They have lived through that part of it. They've wandered throughout the wilderness for 40 years. And he's not even reminding them of why that happened. They were to blame, their ancestors were to blame for that. Okay? And not when they arrived at the promised land the first time, ready to take it, and they sinned. They sinned by not trusting God, not having faith in God. God was going to open the door to them. They could have been there full oh, 40 years earlier, enjoying that land, setting up their families, spreading out through there, defeating the enemy. That could have been 40 years earlier. I brought you to the land of the Amorites who lived east of the Jordan. They fought against you, but I gave them into your hands. I destroyed them from before you, and you took possession of their land. Okay? Okay. Talking about the east side, your right of the Jordan River. That's the east side there. When Balak, son of Zippor, the king of Moab, prepared to fight against Israel, he sent for Balaam, son of Beor, to put a curse on you. But I would not listen to Balaam, so he blessed you again and again, and I delivered you out of his hand. Then you crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho. The citizens of Jericho fought against you, as did also the Amorites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hittites, Girgashites, Hivites, and Jebusites. But I gave them into your hands. All right. What a list of enemies. 
You know, we're not talking about, about armies of, of a few hundred or even maybe thousands, but huge armies. Okay, they have lived in this land for just generation after generation. They have populated the land and built an army to protect themselves even from each other. And those armies have, have been pitted against the Israelites, a wandering tribe of people, a nation of people with no home, but searching for one. I sent the hornet ahead of you, which drove them out before you, also the two Amorite kings. You did not do it with your own sword and bow. All right, we're going to stop there. So did he send an actual, you know, swarm of bees and, and hornets and wasps? I think that would be awesome. I like that picture. You know, send them ahead and sting all the soldiers, and, and those with allergies would maybe pass on. But no, that's not what he's talking about here, okay? It's even mentioned in Exodus uh, chapter 23, verse 28, if you want to just check that yourself, okay? He sent the hornet ahead of them. That was his spirit, okay? That was his power. If you really think of it in context, God had put the fear of the, of the Israelite nation into his enemies. Rachel, when the spies went in her home, what did she say? She goes, we have heard about you. We have heard the stories that your God is going to allow you to defeat us and take all of our land. Now that's a hornet right there. That's piercing to the heart. People throughout the land were already afraid. It's that advance message getting there and putting that fear in them because a fearful enemy is someone you can defeat. Okay? They lack that confidence. God had gone ahead of them in his wisdom, his power, and prepared the way. He had, he had weakened the enemy. You did not do it with your own sword and bow. It was not because of you. It was because of God. Okay? Now, he's not saying, well, you know, just because you had that bow and sword, you didn't, you know, take this nation. What he's saying is, no, you could not have done it without God. All right? The, the best example we have there is, is the destruction of I. Remember, they had, had, were confident, but they did not know that sin was there. So when they went to attack I, thinking, piece of cake, we got this. God's with us. You know, we just did, pulled off this huge, huge battle here and won. And so now we're going to take I, and they got there, and what happened? God was not with them. Okay. That was a lesson they had to learn the hard way. People were killed. Is Israelites were killed. And that's something that you remember. When they come back and you ask, well, where's my husband? Where's my son? Where's my brother? Oh, they, they died. Okay, that hits home. So they learned from that lesson there. That it is about God, not what they do. So I gave you a land on which you did not toil, and cities you did not build. And you live in them and eat from vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. Wow. I would love to move into a fully furnished house that had everything, and, and just uh, I didn't have to, you know, be great. Just move the family right in. Well, that's what God, God is telling them. I mean, you got to think these people are supporting themselves on a daily basis. This is not going to work, getting a paycheck, and then going to the grocery store a couple times a week and getting your food and all. This is where you are scratching in the dirt, growing things, uh, taking care of livestock for your food, your clothing, you know, uh, you're, you're farming, you're herding, all these things on a daily basis for your basic life. 
And God is saying, I gave this to you. You did not have to start from scratch. I gave you a home that's fully furnished. And then we get into something I really love. We use this uh, quite a bit. Now, fear the Lord and serve him with all your all faithfulness. All right? So Joshua's making a commitment here, but let's let's keep in mind that he is talking to his family. He is talking to somebody he considers his own as if they were his own children. He loves them. He he cares for them. He doesn't want anything bad to happen to them. Okay, so he is a father figure for them. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. All right, I'm going to stop there. We just learned something. Just from that part. There seem to still be idols among them. How can that be? Okay, I, th I thought that that was something that God just detested. How can there be idols still among them? Okay, now part of the reason here is, is the foreigners. Okay, people that they have conquered, people that are still alive, survivors, people that they've, they've said, you know, you remember the Gibeonites? We will serve you. Don't kill us. They were not J the Jewish people. They were foreigners. Okay? But they were allowed to be in among them. So there's an influence there. They brought their own things, their own idols. And I'm sure that kind of got spread out among the, the Israelite nation as well. Okay? Now, I'm going to hit on that for just a second. Yeah, i got time. How do we carry idols among us today? I want you to think really hard for yourself. Okay, we know the big ones. Oh, money. That, that wonderful job. That beautiful home. Whatever is in front of you and distracting you and causing you not to look at God, that is an idol. That's our modern day idol. Okay, but even think of the small things that we carry around and hold dear and precious and, and such. Anything today, anything that causes a distraction from God is an idol. Okay? I, I, I'm positive we have all been there. We know what that is like. All right, now here's where Joshua gets really serious and and we see this verse over and over again. Okay, we're in verse 15. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. He's saying... Make your choice now. There is no one or the other. There's no mixing it. We're not going to have, you know, our, our belief in God, but we're also going to take from these other religions and, and, you know, because we're in this land of, of other people, you know, and, and we're associating with them and they're influencing us. He's saying, you make this choice right now. I know where I stand. Okay, that's, that's the father figure there going, this is what I believe, and I'm going to stand firm in it, and I want you with me. But you have to decide for yourself. Many of us who have maybe grown up in the church have even faced the same thing today. We rode the coattails of our parents into the church. We came to service, we went to Sunday Bible school, we played with the youth group, you know, but but we didn't own it. And, and maybe we we learned enough to say, yeah, I need to be baptized and all. But it's not until as, as an adult, usually, that we have to decide for ourselves 
where we're going to serve, who we're going to serve. Are we going to serve the world and our pleasures and ourselves? Or are we going to serve God? Okay? Now, and you probably know as well as I do how many people fall off that path. That decision you've seen them make, you know, whether it was, it was a quiet decision or not, they've decided, I'm going to serve myself. You know, I'll, I'll mix in a little God there. I'll go and, and warm a pew every now and then. You know, if I get into a struggle, I'll ask for some prayers. You know, or, or then that just doesn't work. God is a jealous God, and he wants our attention completely. Now, that, I'm not saying that you have to, you know, be here 100% of the time, that you have to fill this pew every time the doors are open. No, I'm saying that in your life, your attitude, your spirit, you need to have God there. Whether it's at work, at home, with friends, the activities you do, you still have to have God there. All right, so, so Joshua has just said, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Make a choice. Then the people answered. Okay, these are all the leaders, the elders, the leaders, the judges, the officials. Far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us and our parents up out of Egypt from that land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites, who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. Boy, that's what somebody really wants to hear. That's what a father figure, a leader wants to hear. Wow. I challenged them and they accepted it. Joshua said to the people, You are not able to serve the Lord. He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after he has been good to you. He's telling them, do not be overconfident. Okay? Joshua knows these people just like we would know our children. Their weaknesses, their strengths. And, and how many times do we say, oh, I would never do that. And within a few days, we've probably gone against that commitment. Okay, we've fallen short. Joshua knows these people. He knows what's going to happen. And he's saying, whoa. Okay, I like what you're saying. That's wonderful. But you know what happens if you don't do this. God is going to destroy you. You're being overconfident. Re realize reality that you're going to fall. But the people said to Joshua, No, we will serve the Lord. Okay? Do you think he's, he's still doubting them? He knows their track record. You know, they've, they've fought valiantly. They have obeyed God. But Joshua knows even the generations before them how they fell. He knows that even in the wilderness when God was providing everything to them, their food, their water, he was protecting them, he was leading them, and they still complained. Okay? Many times we heard them say, Ah, oh, I had so much back in Egypt. They were forgetting all the good things. Well, it's just like us. We forget the good things and many times focus on the bad things. Then Joshua said, You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, we are witnesses. Boy, that, that confidence is just brimming out of them. Now then, said Joshua, throw away the foreign gods that are among you 
and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. Whatever you're clinging to, get rid of it. Now's the time. You've made this decision. You have stated it and been a witness to it to yourselves. Get rid of the dirt. Whatever you're clinging to, get rid of it. And the people said to Joshua, We will serve the Lord our God and obey him. On that day, Joshua made a covenant for the people, and there at Shechem, he reaffirmed for them decrees and laws. If you remember in Deuteronomy, Moses went through all the laws again to the people, reaffirming what they've already been told, making sure that they know, just as a father says, okay, I've told you this many times, but I'm going to tell you again. I really want you to listen. Joshua does the same thing. I want you to listen again. I know I'm, I'm close to death. I'm going to die. And, and I want comfort that you have heard me, that I have been clear to you and, and laid out this path for you. And Joshua recorded these things in the book of the law of God. Then he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak near the holy place of the Lord. See, he said to all the people, this stone will be a witness against us. It has heard all the words the Lord has said to us. It will be a witness against you if you are untrue to your God. This was actually the seventh memorial. They love memorials. Okay, Actually, we love memorials. Okay, we've got them all over the city, the state, the nation. We have a memorial that we do every Sunday. This do in remembrance of me. To remember Christ and what he did for us. That is a memorial. They used objects, a stone. It's not an idol. It's something to say, when you look at this, you need to remember this. Okay? When we take of this, this is what you need to remember. It's the same concept. Then Joshua dis dismissed the people, each to their own inheritance. After these things, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. And they buried him in the land of his inheritance at Timnath Serah, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gesh. Israel served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had experienced everything the Lord had done for Israel. Okay, then we get into something a little bit different. All right, it's, it's interesting. You have to go back and, and look a little bit. And Joseph's bones, which the Israelites had brought up from Egypt, were buried at Shechem in the tract of land that Jacob bought for a hundred pieces of silver from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. This became the inheritance of Joseph's descendants. And Eleazar, son of Aaron, died and was buried at Gibeah, which had been allotted to his son Phinehas in the hill country of Ephraim. The leaders are dying. Okay? There's going to be a whole shift of, of burden to the people and the leaders they appoint, that God appoints among them. All right? It's like the end of a story. But what's interesting there at the end is talking about Joseph. You have to go back and remember that in, in what we've, we've, you have studied long before, that Joseph, as a ruler, and meeting up with his family again there at the end, and setting the path for, for the people, he had said, I want you to take my bones. Okay? I want to be buried someplace else don't want to be buried here I want to be with my people so they honored that they have been carrying Joseph's bones with them through this entire journey all the way and now that they have arrived in the promised land that's where he's buried with his his people when we see that Eleazar who's been Beside Joshua this whole time has also passed away and been buried. Okay?
That ends the book of Joshua. All right, now, you need to read it for yourself. It applies to us today. All right, now, let me just switch here real quick. Next Sunday starts the next quarter, and it's going to be 2 Corinthians. There will be a class in here. There will be a class in 14 15, I believe. Uh, take a look at some of the posters that, are, that should be posted out there, and there will be more in the bulletin. Uh, Wednesday nights, I really want to encourage you to be here Wednesday nights. There are several classes going on. It's going to be an interesting spring quarter. So I encourage you midweek to come, get recharged, refreshed, and fellowship as we learn God's Word. Thank you. Let's get ready for worship.